arguably one of the finest football players, receivers to ever play the game. And when I mention the name, the guys will know who I'm talking about. I'm talking about Jerry Rice of the 49ers. You remember him. Outstanding receiver. One of the best that ever played the game. He holds all sorts of NFL records and a few Super Bowl wins along the way. Now, not many people know of the details of his rigorous training throughout the years. Um, part of that training was something that was called the hill. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but the hill was, it was a four-mile trail that was literally on a hill um, outside of Redwood City, California. He ran this hill every day during the off-season and it was part of his endurance training. When he was asked why he did it, he said, it taught me how to be able to endure in pain and still perform at a very high level. And clearly it took a great deal of discipline to commit to this level of training. Now the great cellist, Pablo Casals, some of you may have heard of him. Pablo Casals was probably the most talented cellist in history. Back in 1957, he was 80 years old and they made a short movie about his life. And in fact, they call it A Day in the Life of, of Pablo Casals. And the movie's director, after meeting with him, asked him, why do you continue to practice four or five hours a day every day? And, and Casals looked at him, he says, because I think I'm making progress. <laughs> now, great musicians, great athletes, they all have one thing in common. They persevere at their craft and they're disciplined at it. They don't take any shortcuts. They don't take the easy way out. They don't expect someone else to do it. But they do want to excel. They want to be the best that they can be. Now, for sure, there's a certain amount of talent and gifting involved. But, but the achievement and level of performance that we see in all of these people that we've come to admire all come about through diligent, and disciplined work. The author of Hebrews, clearly someone who was with the Apostle Paul quite a bit, spent an entire chapter speaking about those who were faithful, and you know what I'm speaking of, Hebrews chapter 11. Those were people who had their faith credited to them. Abraham, Moses, the prophets, and the many others were told. He referred to them as a great cloud of witnesses, those who we would want to emulate. And they all had seemingly unshakable faith in God. Now, right after that, in Hebrews chapter 12, we read this. Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. He says, run with perseverance. Perseverance. Now, it's interesting that the author of Hebrews felt compelled to even write those instructions when you think about it, because he knew that we don't normally think that way. We just don't. None of us can wake up one day and go out and run a marathon. None of us can wake up one day and just become a virtuoso. We might want to. We might really want to do that. But, but these things don't happen overnight. It takes time. It takes perseverance. And it takes discipline. To be the best that you can be at anything takes discipline. So for the next few weeks, we're going to be contemplating spiritual disciplines. And you might be wondering why. Isn't having simple faith in Christ enough? While it certainly is your assurance of eternal life, you still walk around in a fallen body. We're still fallen creatures. And so we need to work out our faith. And there's also much about God to know. We don't know everything. There's much about the spiritual life to experience. We haven't experienced it all yet. And there's so much in our walk with him to be blessed by. Our desire should be that we want to be the best that we can be toward our Lord. And to do that, we need to grow in our spirituality. We need to mature. Just like as when we grew up, our parents had to discipline us as we matured. We need to mature so our faith is indeed seemingly unshakable and that our lives honor God in all ways. The spiritual life takes discipline on our part. And that's what we're going to be exploring for the next coming weeks. 
So before we begin all this, let me just, let me just pray for us. Heavenly Father, again, we, we worship you. We thank you for your word. But above all that, we thank you for Jesus Christ, the one who, the one who took the wrath that we deserve on our behalf. And it is only through him that we are saved from your wrath. But it is also through him that we have access to you. And it is through him that we have the assurance of eternal life. And so we pray, Lord, that as we embark on this new journey, that you would, you would open our eyes, you would open our hearts. You would convict us where we need convicting. You would discipline us where we need it. And you would guide us and lead us so that we would become, as my brother said, wholehearted disciples of Jesus. Let me give this to you in Jesus' name. Amen. A couple of questions. Would you say that Jesus led a godly life while he was here on earth? Of course you would. <laughs> Wasn't it your question? <laughs> would you say that the apostles led a godly life while they were here on earth? Of course you would. Would you say that you are leading a godly life like they did while you are here on earth? You might want to stop and think about that for a minute before you answer it. Because you have to remember, all of them, all of them committed their lives entirely to the Lord. Entirely. So again, are you leading a godly life? Can you sing that song that we sang earlier, I surrender all and mean it? You're called to lead a godly life. Romans 8, 28, 30 says this, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. You are called to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. To be conformed means to be changed from your original state into a new one. You are called to live a godly life. This tells us that godliness is not reserved for the super spiritual. It's not something that, that we see as, as almost impossible as we read about the lives of Paul or John or Peter. It seems like, like we can't come close to their godliness. But a life of godliness is what we are called to. It's how we are to live our lives. It's not something we inherently know. It's not something we're born with. It's not something we can just do. We might know right from wrong, but godliness is, is something we have to learn. It's, it's, it's something we have to be taught. It has to develop. It has to mature. It takes effort to be conformed to Christ-likeness. Paul told Timothy, train yourself to be godly. Train yourself to be godly. The Greek word Paul used here is gymnazo, which is where we get the word gymnasium from. So it means to, to train with one's full effort. It means to train as if you were doing this intense workout. It means to strive earnestly with all that you have. It means running that hill every day. Or it means practicing four to five hours every day. We can easily grasp the idea of working out in the physical sense. We get that. We know that we have to exercise our bodies to keep them healthy, and the more diligent we are at that, the stronger we get. Now, Paul recognized that too, because he went on. After he said, train yourself to be godly, he goes on to say, for physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. So spiritual training, spiritual discipline has immense value for us. It leads to, to spiritual maturity. It cultivates the fruits of the Spirit because it all ultimately draws us closer to the Lord. It deepens our faith in Him. And our relationship with Him gets even more intimate. It's essential for a disciple. Now, I know many make the connection between the words disciple and discipline, but in the Greek, they are actually two different words. The idea, though, is the same. A disciple is one who is being trained a learner, and discipline is the training. It's essential, for us to, for the, uh, it's essential for us who want to be disciples of Jesus Christ to be disciplined in our walk. 
In fact, uh, R. Kent Hughes said this. He goes, no discipline, no discipleship. So important is this idea of discipline that, that Jesus himself said it in Luke 9. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? It's essential for the disciple of Jesus Christ to exercise spiritual discipline. Spiritual discipline is also a fruit of the Spirit. Now, you know the list. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Self-control. Discipline. It's for our own benefit. It's for our own good. It's for our maturity in Christ. It's for our relationship with Christ. Donald Whitney, he's the author of the study guide we'll all be working through, he says this about exercising and maintaining spiritual disciplines. He says that we place ourselves before God for him to work in us. Now Richard Foster, who wrote in his book Celebration of Discipline, which is an outstanding book, he says that God has given us the disciplines of the spiritual life as a means of receiving his grace. We don't do them as a legalistic activity in our lives in order to gain favor from God. That's not why we do it. Instead, we do them because we love God and we want to please him. Now, how do we do this? How do we do this? Well, that, that, what does it take? And that, that's what we're going to see in the coming weeks and also in, in the studies, in the small group studies. But the Apostle Paul summarized it well in his first letter to the Corinthian church. Now, let's face it. That church needed a lot of work. <laughs> they needed a lot of teaching, they needed a lot of training, and they needed a lot of discipline. But Paul says this, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly, I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I've preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. It's denying yourself. It's bringing yourself under submission to God. It's training. It's a concerted effort. It's doing something we don't normally do. It is running for the prize, and it does require sacrifice on our part. But like in any other relationship, your relationship with the Lord, is a, it's a two-way street. You have to do your part. You can't just sit back, dumb and happy, and, and let the Lord do all the work. That's not how relationships work. It takes two. And, and believe me, God's doing his part. And, and then some. <laughs> but we have to do ours. It takes commitment. It takes perseverance. It takes discipline. But it's well worth it. It's well worth it. I mean, what can surpass knowing the Lord better each day? What can surpass a spiritual maturity where you have a constant awareness of the Holy Spirit's presence in your heart? What can surpass a, a deeply rooted faith when this world throws all sorts of stuff at you? What can possibly be better than any of that? Do you ever look at someone and say, you know, I wish I had their faith? I really do. Do you, do you wonder where it comes from? Or do you get down to yourself thinking, you know, I can't pray like this one does, or, or I wish I knew the better Bible like that one does, or I, I just wish I was better at it. How do you think those people got that way? <laughs> it comes from a disciplined life focused on Jesus and his grace upon us. It comes from a desire to know God more and more. And again, it is not to earn favor. We do it because he loved us first and we love him now. But all of that, all of that comes from diligent and intentional living for him. Now, while our studies in the small groups will go deeper into the spiritual disciplines, and, and I, can't, I can't encourage you all enough to get plugged into one of those groups. We have the, the Wednesday afternoon ladies, the Wednesday night group here. We have a Saturday morning men's group we're starting. I mean, minimally, at least get the book, the study guide we're using, because even that, it's chock full of practical application of these things. 
Now, the sermon series will explore the disciplines at a higher level, but you'll be able to get dive much deeper in, in the groups. So in the coming weeks, we're going to consider the disciplines of taking in his word, of the practice of prayer, the wonder of worship, reaching the world, and living a life marked by joyful sacrifice. We begin next week with something that it prob- is probably the most foundational thing a Christian can do, and that is to be totally devoted in being in his word, to literally take it in, to read it, to digest it, to let it settle into your heart. We need to take in his word because it's our spiritual nourishment. The word of God is his revelation of himself to mankind. In it, we see his everlasting love. We see his steadfast faithfulness to his people. We see his compassion. We see his mercy. We see his wisdom. We see his power. We see his glory. To not be in his word is to starve your soul. Jesus said when he was being tempted by Satan that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Now where did that come from? Deuteronomy 8. The word of God. Paul compared this idea of taking in the word of God to to taking in milk and solid food. It's nourishment for the soul. The word of God is powerful. Paul said faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. The word of Christ. We have the word of Christ in in the Bible. The words of Christ are in here. As obvious as this sounds, it is critical to our relationship with God to spend time in his word. And the practice of prayer. I think most of us would would admit that our prayer life is probably seriously lacking. But practice, a practice of prayer, practice as as in a persistent act that we do. This is how we communicate with God. How we can praise him, worship him. How we can confess our sin to him and receive his mercy. How we can present our needs to him. How we can thank him. And Paul said we should pray without what? Ceasing. Constantly, pray without ceasing, pray always, pray all the time, pray first, not when everything's falling apart. Go to God first. It's not something we normally do. We'd rather handle things on our own. We don't think to pray first, we think of it as a last resort. But to be conformed takes discipline. A dynamic, active prayer life will draw you closer to God every day. Now, another discipline is worship. Worship. It's all throughout Scripture. God is to be praised. God is to be worshipped. God is to be honored. God is to be revered. God is to be feared. God is to be obeyed. It is all an act of worship. We don't think of worship as a discipline, do we? But we should, because the question to ourselves should be, do we do it all the time? Or, as Jay was saying, do we just do it on Sunday mornings? That's that's that cubicle in our life. We put it there, and then the rest of our life we do something different. You worship him all the time. Do you give him the glory due to his name when something good happens? Do you praise him and marvel at his glory when you see a beautiful sunrise or an awesome sunset? Or when it rains after a long drought? Or when someone you love is healed of an illness? Do you praise him? Do you worship him for that? Do you contemplate his majesty and bow down and worship before him? He saved you. He saved you from sin. You can and you should worship him for that. We have a tendency to worship other people or other things or even ourselves. And we're doing that without even knowing it. And it's through the discipline of worship where we can be humbled in recognizing his worthiness. We gather together to worship. It takes discipline to worship together. It takes discipline to come here every Sunday. Eh, I'm too tired today. It's too nice a day. I'm going to go out somewhere. I'll just watch it online. It takes discipline to get up and come here every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. and join others in worshiping God. In fact, I recently read that Sunday morning worship is a decision made on Saturday night. 
Each of us are encouraged in our faith when we all raise our voices together in song and worship. Worship is essential to our spiritual health, and to neglect it is to starve your soul. Reaching the world, evangelizing, being ready to give the reason for the hope that you have, that takes discipline. It's not something we all naturally do, especially in this day and age. Nobody wants to hear what we have to say about Jesus and sin and salvation. But the church is called to go. Go and make disciples. It doesn't say stay in the building and wait for them to come to you. It says go and make disciples. Go and tell them the good news that forgiveness of sin is possible only through faith in Jesus Christ. The one who took the wrath of God in your place. And that he died, he rose, he ascended, and he is now on his throne. Go and tell them of the kingdom of God. Yeah, that, that takes discipline. <laughs> that takes work. But can you imagine if someone never told you about Jesus? Can you imagine it? What if they were afraid? They didn't know how you were going to react. Or what if they thought they didn't know enough? Where would you be? Where would you be if somebody didn't tell you? This is a spiritual discipline because God uses each of us to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Look, that, that's how he chose to do it. That's his plan. It's not mine. <laughs> that's his plan. There's a great author, uh, Paul Tripp. He wrote a book, and, and, and I think the title of the book really summarizes this. The name of the book is Instruments in the Redeemer's Hands. God uses you to bless others. But to be aware of that and all the situations that God puts us in to share his glorious truth takes discipline. We have to be plugged in with him. It takes a commitment to serve him. And it takes a close relationship with him to even hear his prompting. This is not strictly for pastors or elders or deacons or people that are just super spiritual. It's each and every believer's calling. You always have to be ready to give the reason for the hope that you have. And the last one we'll consider in our messages is the discipline of joyful sacrifice. Paul told the Philippians to have the mind of Christ. Consider others' needs over your own. We're told God loves a cheerful giver. And we're not talking just money and tithes. I mean, that's, that's part of it. But to consider the needs of others over your own first. Someone needs a meal. Someone needs a ride. Someone needs a visit. Someone needs a call. You have to give your time to do that. You have to sacrifice something to do that. You have to give of yourself to do that. But not only does it bring a great blessing to the person in need, it brings a great blessing to you because you serve God. You serve the Lord. The same Lord who were told for the joy set before him endured the cross. He endured the cross for you. So can't you joyfully give of yourself for his name's sake? <laughs> this, this takes a heart that is humbled enough to know that we're naturally selfish. And we need to discipline ourselves to live in a way that is not who we naturally are. So, so this will be a journey for us. This will be a time of serious self-examination. This will be a time where we'll be convicted of, of how we've been neglecting our spiritual health. It's like going to the doctor and he's going to look at you and say, you're overweight. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah, it's not good for you. Yeah, I, I know. <laughs> It'll be a time when we'll all be challenged. Challenged to push ourselves just a little bit more. To take those steps toward him. To place ourselves in his hands to mold us and conform us. It'll be convicting. It'll be challenging. But it will be incredibly rewarding. Your faith, your spiritual maturity, your relationship with him will all grow. It will all grow. So let, let me close with this. During my devotions this past week, I was reading um, Psalm 145. And I don't think it was a coincidence, actually. But in this psalm, David is crying out for mercy. He's beseeching God for help and protection from his enemies. And let's face it, as a king, he had plenty of enemies. He admits to God that his spirit was growing faint and his heart was dismayed. 
Please, Lord, answer me. Show me the way I should go, he cries. But then he says this. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. May your good spirit lead me on level ground. That's discipline. That's discipline. He turned everything completely over to God. And that's the road we're about to travel. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we look forward to this time. We look forward to this season in the church. We look forward to wanting to draw closer to you. We look forward to the way you will draw closer to us. Because your word does say, if we draw near to you, you will draw near to us. Father, we confess that we have neglected a lot of these things. Being in your word and prayer and worship and and evangelism. And so, Father, we... uh, we pray that you would, you, would, you would be merciful upon us, that your spirit would move in, it, in each and every one of us so that we would be willing to surrender all and give ourselves entirely to you so that we would be wholehearted disciples, fully functioning disciples, fully devoted disciples of Jesus Christ in this world. And so, Lord, we pray your blessing upon this season in our church as we go through the coming weeks. We pray your blessing upon the groups that meet and all the discussions that they have. And most of all, Father, we pray a blessing upon this church, that this church would deepen in its faith for you, grow in its love for you, and have a newfound zeal and passion for sharing your gospel in this world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 